Mark into chapter 9. Begin reading at uh, verse 14 and we'll read through to verse 37. Our text this evening is the verses 30 through 37. We begin at verse 14. Uh, And when he, that is Jesus, came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. He asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought with unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should, uh, should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and wallowing, foaming, wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose, and when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer, and fasting. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? They held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And may the Lord bless to us uh, his own word as uh, we read it there in the Gospel of Mark. We're looking, as I indicated, brethren, at verses 30 through 37 of this ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark this evening. Given the length of the passage, I won't read it again, but it might be helpful if you were to have your Bibles open at uh, that uh, section of the Word of God. You will have noticed uh, as we read through those different parallel accounts in Matthew and Mark and Luke, the hour for which Jesus Christ had come into the world was in fact rapidly approaching All things were being carefully orchestrated in preparation for that hour. In particular, Jesus was preparing and equipping his disciples for the role that they would fulfil after Calvary. Calvary. The cross would occasion profound confusion and deep distress among 
the disciples. And so therefore, leading up to Calvary, Jesus' tutoring of the disciples became more urgent and more targeted. This instruction uh, continues in our text, which finds Jesus and his disciples making their way through Galilee to Capernaum. And this is indeed the last time uh, that they will go uh, together to Capernaum. Jesus, in preparation for Calvary, uh, at this time canvasses with his disciples his death and resurrection. We see that in verse 31. He says to them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. This was the second time that uh, Jesus had broached that subject with his disciples. Only weeks before following Peter's confession, Thou art the Christ, he had told his disciples, as recorded in Mark 8.31, he told them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. On that occasion, the very thought of Jesus dying had been so abhorrent to the disciples that you recall that Peter had rashly rebuked the Lord for even contemplating such a thing. Jesus had also raised the subject of his death and resurrection with Peter, James and John as they had descended from the Mount of Transfiguration. That's recorded in the earlier part of Mark 9 and verses 9 and 10. And there on that occasion, uh, Jesus, as they came down from the mountain, charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And as a result of him saying that, we find that the disciples were somewhat perplexed because they questioned among themselves what did he mean when he spoke about uh, his rising from the dead. Jesus' instruction to his disciples as regards his death and resurrection, uh, though now becomes more and more explicit. Uh, nonetheless, interestingly, we are told uh, here in verse 32 that they understood not that saying. The question arises, why did they not understand that saying? The instruction was explicit. Uh, the Lord did not hide from them the implications of his death and resurrection, yet we find that the scripture records that they do not understand. And the primary reason it would appear as to why they did not understand what Jesus was saying was because what he declared to them did not fit with their conception of him as the Messiah, nor was it consistent with their conception of the kingdom that they thought that he had come to establish. Their conceptions of both the Messiah and the kingdom were earthly, not heavenly, they were carnal, not spiritual. In their understanding, there was no room for the cross and therefore no place for the resurrection. And for those same reasons, we are told also in our text that they are actually afraid to ask him. They did not ask Jesus what he meant, uh, but they rather, in fact, would prefer to remain ignorant uh, of those things because to have inquired further might have, in fact, resulted in greater clarity and, indeed, the complete dismantling of their treasured hopes and expectations. And those hopes and expectations were very dear uh, to the disciples. And that becomes painfully and embarrassingly evident in what follows. At the same time that Jesus was teaching his disciples about his death and resurrection, you'll notice that their thoughts, in fact, were elsewhere. They weren't thinking, really, about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but they were actually engaged in animated discussion among themselves as to their respective places of honour and glory that they might anticipate in what they thought would be a great earthly kingdom. Uh, there's heavy irony here. While Jesus is enlightening them as regards the deepest aspect of his humiliation. The disciples are actually preoccupied with their own earthly exaltation and glory. Uh, that is, in many respects, incongruous. Uh, in, in a certain sense, one might even describe it as being obscene. 
but it's a mindset, brethren, that is not all that far from any of us. Well, look at this word of God in this evening under this uh, theme, humility, the mark of true greatness. Humility, the mark of true greatness. The surprising standard is the first point we're going to look at. Secondly, the living illustration. And then finally, the personal significance. Who should be the greatest? That was the issue that generated animated, if not heated, discussion among the 12 disciples as they made their way to Capernaum. Matthew, in his parallel account in Matthew 18, puts the question in the slightly uh, more uh, exuberant terms. He says, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? As noted, that formulation of the issue was predicated upon the disciples' conception of the kingdom of heaven. The conception of the kingdom of heaven as being a kingdom of earthly glory and grandeur with Jesus as an earthly king. And so that's what they were concerned about when they are considering this question is who is the greatest in the kingdom? The issue for the disciples was not so much which one of them would be the greatest of all, but the issue is more general. It related to their respective standings or rankings in relation to one another so far as the kingdom was concerned. In other words, what would be their relative positions vis-a-vis one another in the kingdom? We're not told as to how this issue arose. It was possibly prompted by a perception among the twelve Uh, as a result of the seemingly privileged positions of Peter, James and John. Uh, You recall, after all, that Peter, James and John have been specifically chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ to accompany him up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And as a result of uh, their accompanying him there, those three were privileged to receive a glimpse of the future honour and glory that Jesus himself would inherit. The inability of the disciples uh, that had remained behind to cast out the evil spirit from the young man may also have prompted uh, this discussion concerning greatness in the kingdom. But whatever the reason, the issue was a live one among the disciples. And it was an issue that caused a measure of agitation among them. The tension was evident as they made their way uh, to Capernaum the body language, the facial expressions, the terse whispers all signalled that there was something amiss among them. Conscious of the nature of the dispute between them, uh, the disciples actually attempted to keep the issue from Jesus Christ. That was impossible. Upon arrival in Capernaum, Jesus asked them directly, what was it? that you disputed among yourselves by the way. It would seem that out of an acute sense of embarrassment, the disciples, we're told in verse 34, held their peace. They weren't uh, keen uh, to answer. And so they remained silent. They need not have bothered. Uh, Jesus was already well aware of what had produced the tension among them. He knew that they'd been arguing over who should be the greatest. Though a number of them were lowly fishermen and one of them a despised tax collector, each entertained a favourable conception of their own significance and importance. The fact that they all came from lowly backgrounds did not mean that they were not proud, self-centred men. They were the sons of Adam, just as you and I, brethren, are the sons of Adam with all that that entails. And so therefore, these men uh, were also, as is true perhaps even of us, they were staunchly protective 
of their self-interests. None were inclined to surrender authority or honour uh, to another. None were willing to accept a lesser place. Self-interest was alive and well even among the disciples of Jesus Christ. They're not appreciated by the disciples. The question as to who should be the greatest was a potentially divisive issue. Indeed, it was an issue that was fraught with danger and had the very real potential to cultivate envy, jealousy and even hatred among the disciples. You see some indication of that at different times in the scriptures, but certainly such attitudes, if allowed to fester, would inevitably impede the kingdom work that the disciples were to undertake. And the the same remains true today, brethren. If we allowed uh, such attitudes of envy and jealousy and even hatred to arise as regards our position and our place in the kingdom, uh, then that inevitably will impede uh, the work of the Church of Jesus Christ today. Indeed, uh, those things, envy, jealousy, pride, hatred, uh, uh, actually debilitate and damage the spiritual well-being and the ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ. And those things, in fact, are the root cause of uh, much, much of the jockeying uh, that go on goes on in the church even today. It's actually the cause of the what I would describe as the jockeying for authority and influence that actually exists even in our own church today. And we might think that's not a proper assessment. That there is no jockeying. There is no uh, seeking to attain unto positions of authority and influence in the church today. But brethren. I'd suggest to you that we we actually don't know ourselves if that's what we think. The reality is that these things are in our midst and they're in our midst because they're actually in our own hearts. Those uh, qualities, those qualities of self-interest, of jealousy, of pride, uh, they're the qualities that are destructive, destructive of friendships, they're destructive of fellowship and communion. They're a source of disunity, uh, such that they're harmful to the witness and the work of the church. And furthermore, they are the source of much discouragement, Uh, discouragement particularly to the spiritually weak and to the vulnerable. They contribute to the breakdown of relationships. They cause uh, tensions in families. Uh, They cause hurt among brethren. And they occasion, in fact, spiritual inactivity and inertia in the church of Jesus Christ. The end result of those things is there is is actually a failure uh, to promote and advance the kingdom of God in a God-honouring, God-glorifying way. With the welfare of the New Testament church in mind, we find here that Jesus addresses this issue directly with his disciples. Having lodged in a house in Capernaum, he sat his disciples down and he instructs them concerning true greatness. Not greatness as it's perceived by the world, uh, not greatness so far as the affairs of men are concerned, but what he takes up with them and teaches them concerning his greatness as regards the kingdom of God. Now those those things are very different. Greatness in the world and greatness in the kingdom are very different things. And what becomes obvious is that what Jesus had to say was in fact at complete odds with the disciples' conception of greatness. The disciples' conception of greatness was that in fact really of the natural man. A conception of greatness uh, which, uh, with which, brethren, I suspect we are all only too well acquainted In order to understand the uh, thrust of Jesus' teaching on greatness in the kingdom, it's necessary to bear in mind the parallel accounts that we read this evening in Matthew and Luke, and particularly the uh, passage in Matthew chapter 18 and the verses 1 through 5. Matthew's account 
and it supplies the most detailed record of Jesus' instruction on this subject. The account here in Mark that we are using as our text this evening actually abbreviates what is recorded in Matthew's account. Uh, Our text summarises the teaching of Jesus on this subject in verse 35. Uh, Verse 35 reads, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And there Jesus sets forth the fundamental touchstone or standard for true greatness in the kingdom of God. If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. You want to know what true greatness in the kingdom is? That's where you find it. That's that's the description of true greatness in the kingdom of God. If one has a desire to be great, to be first, first in the kingdom, then the same, we are told here, shall be last of all. To put it this way, if you, brethren, want to be first, then you must be willing to be last. Only if you are willing to be last is it possible for you to be first. Now that is totally contrary to the thinking of this world. That's not how the world thinks. It's not how the world perceives of greatness. Jesus turns the ordinary conception of first and last here on its head. Instead of of having the mastery over others, if we would be the greatest, we must be willing to be the servant of all. Literally, uh, the Greek here reads, we must be the minister of all. If we would be the greatest, we must be willing to minister and to serve others. We must be literally willing to wait upon tables. And the implications of this statement are profound. If we would attain unto greatness in the kingdom of God, then our pride and our vanity must be restrained and controlled. We must control and harness our ambitions. We must, with genuine humility, be willing to put others ahead of ourselves and be content to assume the least and most servile place of all. Now that, do, that doesn't come easy. That doesn't come naturally uh, to any of us. Instead of seeking the acknowledgement and the accolades of others, we'll actually take on the position of a servant. And as a servant, there will be times when we are treated with neglect and contempt As I say, is that easy? Well, the answer obviously is no, it's not easy. By by nature, none of us desire to be last. It does not sit well with any of us to be last. In fact, the natural inclination of all of us is to be first. The reality is that we are actually proud creatures by nature. Uh, That's a pride that we've inherited from our first parents. As a result, we are inclined to have an inflated view of self. To be clothed with genuine humility, uh, consequently, is only possible by grace. Genuine humility does not come naturally uh, to any of us. Indeed, genuine humility, humility born of the Spirit of God, is rare. Uh, J.C. Ryle, uh, the English uh, uh, Puritan, uh, wrote of uh, the subject of genuine humility. He says, and I quote, Of all garments, none is so graceful, none wears so well, and none is so rare. Genuine humility requires brethren, the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts. Only then, only when there is a genuine work of the Spirit of God in our hearts will we ever seek the glory of another as opposed to the glory of self. 
Only then will we pursue true greatness rather than the greatness that uh, the natural man finds appealing. Only then will we be willing to be last of all and the servant of all. Brethren, though as believers we should desire greatness, not greatness as defined by the world, but greatness as defined here by Jesus Christ. If we want the church of Jesus Christ to prosper, uh, if we want our congregation, our denomination to grow spiritually, if we want our own personal spiritual life to develop, we need to seek after greatness as defined here by Jesus Christ. If any man desire to be first, the shame shall be last of all and servant of all. And that, of course, brings home uh, to us the, uh, this issue, doesn't it? Is that, is that a description of us? Is that how others conceive of us? Is that evident in our lives? Is that evident in how we deal with others, others in the church? Are we those who are last of all and servant of all? And I think it's true, brethren, all of us would have to say that's not, not necessarily true of us. And we all fall short of uh, this uh, standard set here by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not to say that we should abandon uh, that greatness of which Jesus Christ speaks. What we need is the grace of God and we should seek that grace the more and more that we would know what it is to be last of all and servant of all. What a blessing. What a blessing that is to the church uh, of Jesus Christ. Just as every believer needs to have an intimate spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ, so too it's absolutely essential that as believers we possess a genuine humility born of the Spirit of God. That genuine humility, that humility born of the Spirit of God, is the key to, to, to true greatness in the kingdom. And that's driven home here by the illustration that Jesus sets before his disciples. You read in verse 36, And Jesus took a child and set him in the midst of them. Uh, the identity of the child is not disclosed, nor is the age of the child revealed. What is known is that this was a young child, or as Matthew in his account notes, a little child, small enough that Jesus could take the child up in his arms and embrace him, but not so young that the child could not respond to Jesus' request to come uh, to him. And Jesus used this young child to illustrate the essence of true greatness in the kingdom. That's not immediately apparent uh, from Mark's account, that it is from the account in Matthew's Gospel. Mark simply records that Jesus took a child and set him in the midst of them. Matthew, however, notes the same thing but goes on to record what Jesus had to say in more detail. That's in uh, Matthew 18 and verse 3. There Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus there in Matthew's account uh, tells his disciples that they must be converted. That is, literally, they must turn away. Now, in calling his disciples to conversion, uh, Jesus was not suggesting that his disciples were unbelievers and so needed to experience the work of the Spirit of God in their hearts in order 
that they might turn away from their sins and to walk in newness of life. Uh, He was not speaking of conversion as distinct from regeneration as is sometimes done in the scriptures. The disciples, or at least 11 of them, were true believers and had already experienced a work of grace in their hearts. By conversion here, Jesus was actually speaking of the need that his disciples had and the need that every believer has for daily, ongoing conversion. Brethren, each of us stands in need of daily, ongoing conversion. And like all of us, the disciples suffered from pride. Pride that manifested itself in self-centeredness and in a sense of self-importance. One might go even so far as to say that they had uh, a a pride that uh, rose to the point where they they felt that they were in fact entitled uh, to a place in the kingdom, a place of honour and glory in the kingdom. And uh, as a result of that thinking, the disciples sought greatness, as we've already seen, in terms of this world, in terms of authority and power. And uh, they were seeking through those positions the approval and the accolades of men. Jesus here calls on his disciples to be converted in the sense that they were to daily turn away from their pride, to set that pride aside. By the grace of God, they were to lay aside their self-centeredness, their sense of self-importance and entitlement. Instead, they needed to become, as he says here, they needed to become as little children. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? In what sense were they to become as little children? Well, there are certain natural characteristics exhibited by young children and Jesus tells his disciples that those natural characteristics of a little child ought to characterise them as well. Now, there are a number of things that uh, characterise young children. I think it's true to say that young children are trusting. Uh, They believe what they're told. There's an innocence and a simplicity about young children. Young children are also characterised by truthfulness. Uh, At times they are disarmingly honest. They speak the truth, unlike adults and older children who tend to recast the truth into a form that will best serve their interests. But as is evident from Matthew's account, uh, Jesus had one particular characteristic of a child in mind. And that one particular characteristic was the characteristic of humility. Notice what Jesus says with respect to the child that he has set in the midst of his disciples. This is Matthew 18 and verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he points there to the characteristic of humility. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Childlike humility was the characteristic that the disciples needed to exemplify if they were to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, brethren, young children are not impressed by social status, by rank, by money, by position, by material possessions in general. Rich or poor does not matter uh, to a young child and as a general rule they do not entertain exaggerated ideas even of their own importance nor in general do they possess unrealistic and high opinions of themselves and not in general full of their own importance. Unlike adults they are not vitally concerned about what others think of them not preoccupied with the views of others, nor do they tend to boast of their own accomplishments. Indeed, it's true to say that probably no task is below the dignity of a young child. What is more, they willingly perform tasks with refreshing zeal, 
Indeed, indeed, they enter upon tasks assigned to them with a great measure of enthusiasm. Furthermore, they readily mix with others. They accept others. That is usually true, notwithstanding different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. They have the ability to accommodate those with different gifts as well as those with weaknesses and even deformities. The child was illustrative of true greatness in the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples needed to exhibit that same childlike humility if they were to be great in the kingdom of heaven. And the same holds true for us. Brethren, if you would be great, if we would be great in the kingdom of heaven, if we would be great in the eyes of God, then we too need to exhibit a childlike humility, a childlike humility born of the grace of God and the work of the Spirit. And we need to set aside our desire for earthly greatness and to exhibit genuine spiritual humility, a humility that will see us become the servant of all. As we do that, we will not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We'll have a proper and balanced view of ourselves and of others. We'll not entertain exaggerated ideas of our own gifts or of our own achievements or of our own importance. But we'll see ourselves as we truly are. A childlike humility born of the Spirit of God is actually a beautiful thing uh, to observe. It's not the clambering for the approval of men, not the boasting that often we see among men, but there will be an embracing and accommodation of others, an acceptance even of those who are different, of those who don't quite fit the mould of those from other races and other socioeconomic backgrounds, the rich, the poor, that won't matter. Those from different educational backgrounds, that also will not be a factor. One who's truly great in the kingdom will be willing to perform the lowliest of tasks in the service of the Lord and their fellow saints. Brethren, imagine the blessing. Imagine the blessing that such men and women and truth boys and girls would be to the cause of Christ. And brethren, by God's grace, this is the greatness that we should seek. It's the greatness that we should strive to achieve. Now this word of God carries clear implications for all of us and Jesus highlights the significance of what he has to say here in two ways. This word is significant in the first place on account of what Jesus says in verse 37 of our text. There we read, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Just as you read that and you try to get your mind around that, perhaps it is that the sense of what Jesus is saying there is not immediately, immediately apparent. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Uh, those words are designed undoubtedly to be an encouragement or as John Calvin puts it, they are to be a consolation, a consolation to be last of all and servant of all. In other words, what Jesus says here is designed to be an encouragement to display childlike humility toward others. But let's look a little more carefully at what he says. He says, Whosoever shall receive one of such children... Here, 
such children is not simply a reference to children such as the one that Jesus had taken up in his arms. But children here is employed figuratively. The reference is to the lowliest believer. The lowliest believers are here made comparable to young children because they are seemingly unimportant and of little moment. But Jesus says here, whosoever shall receive one of such children, that is, whosoever shall welcome, whosoever shall embrace one of these lowliest, least significant believers, whosoever will manifest genuine humility to one of these lowliest of saints, he goes on to say, in my name, literally on the basis of my name, that is, on the basis that uh, he or she belongs to Jesus Christ, on that basis that he has been, has been redeemed by Jesus Christ and is, re- is loved by him. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, he says, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Jesus declares that the receipt or welcoming of one of these lowliest, least significant believers is equivalent to the receipt or welcoming of himself. To receive such a one is to receive Jesus Christ himself. And whoever says Jesus, uh, whoever says Jesus that receives him receives not just him, but they receive or welcome also him that sent him. That is, they receive or welcome the triune God who sent Jesus into the world to save even the lowliest of all. More personally and specifically, as we receive, as we welcome, as we manifest genuine humility to the lowliest of our fellow saints, Jesus regards that as our receiving of him, as our showing kindness to him, and in turn as having showed kindness to his heavenly Father, who has entrusted that lowliest saint into the care of his Son. Such conduct, namely the humbling of our souls to receive and welcome into the church such a lowly saint, is viewed by Jesus Christ Indeed, is viewed by the triune God with the highest approbation, its conduct worthy of the highest commendation and honour, its conduct approved of God. It's an act of true greatness. And such conduct, of course, would not amount to greatness in the eyes of the world. Indeed, the world would hardly be bothered with such a lowly saint. But that saint is precious infinitely precious in the eyes of God. And so if we receive such a one, we will be those who are actually great in the eyes of God. That in the first place. This word is significant also in the second place on account of what Jesus says in Matthew 18 and verse 3. There he says, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now imagine for a moment the the disciples' surprise when Jesus said that, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The disciples' concern was with what place they would occupy in the kingdom. Uh, They did not consider for one moment that they might not even have a place in the kingdom at all, They took their place in the kingdom for granted. That was a given. Consequently, when Jesus uh, says, uh, except ye be converted and become uh, as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, that would have been disconcerting uh, to the disciples to say the least. Brethren, to enter into the kingdom, we must become as little children. We must become those who exhibit 
a childlike humility born of the Spirit of God. That's how significant this issue is. It can't have a place in the kingdom, except it is that by God's grace we exhibit that childlike humility, a childlike humility born of the Spirit of God. And what's revealed here is that without that, we will have an absolute certainty never enter the kingdom. What that means then is this. We must be willing. This is not an optional extra. We must be willing to be last of all and the servant of all. That's, the, that's, that's what characterises every child of God. Brethren, we ought not underestimate uh, what is involved here. One might have thought that Jesus had spoken plainly enough on this occasion uh, to dispel any further discussion of greatness in his kingdom among the disciples. So you would have thought that he might have been sufficiently clear to them that this issue would never arise again. And we might even think that uh, the word of God is sufficiently clear to us this evening that this issue uh, should not also be an issue amongst us again. But that was not true so far as the disciples were concerned. And brethren, that's almost certainly true so far as we're concerned as well. Though we may have the life of Christ in us, that pride, self-interest are so ingrained in all of us that we actually struggle to consistently manifest genuine humility. And that certainly was the case with the disciples. Consequently, this was not the last time that Jesus raised this issue with them. In Mark 10, 41 through 45, we read uh, uh, this. The background of that is James and John actually approach Jesus and they approach, the, approaches, uh, they approach Jesus and they say to him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. And then in that passage we read, and when the ten heard it, that is when the other disciples heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. He goes on to say this, But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even, says the Lord, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ was the servant of all. Uh, ought not we follow in the footsteps of our master? It's interesting also, just finally, to note that this issue continued to plague the disciples. The night of the final Passover, uh, in Luke 22, verse 24, we read, so this is the very night prior to the death of Jesus Christ. We read there, and there was also a strife among them, among the disciples. And what was that strife about? It was about this. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? This is a difficult issue, brethren. It's an issue that continues, uh, keeps on giving, doesn't it? Keeps on giving in our lives, uh, the idea of greatness, who is greatest, who will have that place of authority, that pay, place of power. 
Brethren, we do well to take careful note of what Jesus says here. If any man, if any woman desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a brief word of prayer. Lord, uh, we hear uh, what your word says to us. Uh, it's not the first time that we've heard this either. And just like the disciples, uh, we know what we're called to be. But Lord, we also know it's at times such a struggle. Uh, we have within us that remaining corruption and part of that uh, old man of sin uh, comes to us and he says to us, uh, you're not getting the recognition that you deserve. Uh, you, you should be lauded by others. The gifts that you uh, bring uh, to the life of the church, they ought to be acknowledged, they ought to be recognised. It doesn't take all that much to puff us up in pride and uh, very soon uh, we have a conception of self not a proper conception, but a conception that uh, we have uh, generated. And we don't exhibit that uh, childlike humility that is the mark of the child of God. And the result of that absence of childlike humility is all uh, the tension and the strife that so often pervades uh, the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, grant us uh, that recognition of the propensity that we all have uh, to be uh, proud sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Uh, work in our hearts, Lord, by your spirit. Uh, grant us that uh, humility, that childlike humility uh, that allows us to be the servant of all and those who minister uh, to the needs of others. Uh, Lord, may we know the reality of that uh, in our own congregation in our own denomination. And may that be for the glory of thy name and for the good of the church. This we pray for our Lord's sake. Amen.